with the Holy Ghost, how he healed me to the uttermost. When I think about the Lord, how he picked me up and turned me around, how he placed my feet on solid ground. When I think about
the past few weeks, God has begun to reveal to me, which I hope and I pray has been something that has mattered to you, what I believe that as our scriptural, biblical, whatever you want to say, foundation within this church. Meaning, we got to know where we stand. We want to be able to reach people. We want to see people get saved. We want to sing music. We want to preach the gospel. But I'll be honest with you, there's a lot of people who play basketball. You put them on the same basketball team, they don't ever accomplish nothing. It's not because they don't have the ability. It's not because they don't know what they're doing. It's not because they're not going in the right direction. It's not even because they don't have on the same jersey. But One of the things that's probably one of the greatest things that can let any of us down is something that we're going to see tonight, and it's the principle of having a spirit of unity. Without unity, everything can fall apart. Without unity, you've got a lot of people doing their own thing. And let me remind you that just because we're saved, Don't make us all think the same way. The truth be told, we're all to have the mind of Christ. But some of the most judgmental, opinionated people I know is those of us who are saved. Can I get an amen right there? Ain't nothing negative about that. Matter of fact, I think we ought to have some discernment. I think we ought to be able to understand what truth is. But we talked about what God is going to have for us. And I think that every age group is touched by this principle to understand this. There's a lot of things that you and I cannot bring to pass, but there's some things that we can control. And the one thing that we can control is to be able to control the atmosphere. Meaning that we got an atmosphere where if the Lord wants to move in and He wants to save somebody, if the Lord wants to move in and wants to reconcile or restore somebody, if God wants to sit up and start preaching and make the preacher sit down and let the big preacher show up, there's some things that needs to be done in the house of God. And it's an atmosphere that where we have, not that it's just something that, that we create on our own, but because of our spirit of oneness, of our spirit of unity, of our spirit of integrity, because of the godly principles that all of us choose to live by we understand that God promises to use our church for his honor and his glory and that is what it's all about my name ain't on the sign your name ain't on the sign this is God's church and whatever God wants to do with this church is what God needs to be able to do with this church so we're to have an atmosphere a place where people can come And the Holy Ghost is welcome. And if anybody is offended, it ain't going to be the Lord. Can I get a witness right there? We talked last week about having a spirit of integrity. About us not just preaching something on Sunday, but being the same way on Monday. About us not just coming in here and saying we love sinners and act, act like everybody wants to come to the dog and pony show and act like it's a big circus. But then when it comes Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, we don't want to tell nobody about Jesus. Or, or maybe it's something about the house of God. We want to act like we care about the house of God, but we don't take care of the house of God. Or, or, or we want to say that we love somebody. We forgive people and we believe in forgiveness. And we believe in the power of the blood of Jesus Christ, but yet we don't function on that. I mean, the spirit of integrity that what people see is what they get. I mean, we do what God God wants us to do at all times we live to please God but tonight I want to talk about the spirit of unity to understand what it means to be able to be on the same page though different backgrounds ages nationalities races communities whatever it may be that when people walk in the doors of Haynes Baptist Church they almost can get a glimpse of heaven to see what heaven's going to look like when they get there I don't think I need to remind us that when we get to, he- get to heaven, there's going to be people that you might not have thought should have been there. and They're probably not going to think that you should have been there either. Can I get an amen right there? We're going to be surprised who's in heaven and we'll probably be grieved, but I know that there's not feelings there, but I would imagine that if we did, we'd be grieved who didn't make it. A spirit of unity. The Bible says in John chapter number 17, if you notice just a few verses, a lot of these things have been things that have been on my heart in the past, but I believe this is a fundamental truth that we must have tonight. 
not as just a church, but as a child of God, as a believer. It ought to matter to us to have unity one with another. The Bible says when Jesus thought about this principle in John chapter 17, verse number 11, he said, Now I am no more in the world, but these are in the world, and I come to thee, Holy Father. Keep through thine own name, whose thou own hast given me, that they, uh, that they may be one as we are. When Jesus prayed, do you know what Jesus' prayer was? Is that there will be unity among his people. That was the heartbeat of the Lord, the thumbprint, the fingerprint of us being saved is for us to be able to love one another because that's what Jesus said. He says that if you love one another by this, they'll know that you love me. They'll know that you're my disciples if you love one another. That is the fingerprint. That's the identity of a Christian. But the heartbeat of Jesus is he said, listen, if I'm going to bless the church and if I'm going to be excited about what's going on and if I'm going to honor something that you're doing, I want you to know that you need to know Know that I'm praying that you are in harmony the same way, not as everybody else is, not as the disciples were. He said, but the way that the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost, the way that they might have been three different, but at the same time with the same purpose, he said the body of Christ ought to look just like Christ when people look from the outside in by seeing us. Here's the question at hand. When people look at us, do they see harmony like they see in Jesus? Do they see friction? Do they see division? Do they see a oneness? Do they see one thing on Sunday and hear backbiting on Monday? Talk about unity. He said in that same chapter, if you look over in verse number 21, chapter number 17, he said that they all may be one as thou, Father, art in me and I in thee, that they they also may be one in us, and that the world may believe that thou hast sent me. Notice, if you will, verse number 22. He says, And the glory which thou gavest me, I, ga- I have given them, that they, be, that they may be one, even as we are one. It was Jesus' heart for us to have unity in the house of God. Listen to me. Does it matter to you? Does it matter to you that you and I get along? Does it matter to you and you and her get along? Does it matter to you that you and he get along? Does it matter to you that there's not division? Does it matter to you that we're on the same page? I didn't say that we do everything alike and we got the same preferences. We ain't all going to like the same thing. We eat different things in different ways. Some of us eat meatloaf and we'll eat plain meatloaf. Some of us eat meatloaf and we add mushrooms in it. Some of us eat meatloaf and put ketchup on it. Some of us eat meatloaf and put green peppers in it. Some of us eat meatloaf and put green peppers in it and put ketchup on it. Somebody say amen. But the truth be told, it's still meatloaf. Can I get a witness? Can I get a witness? It's the same thing with church. We might have a different desire, but the truth be told is that the fundamentals are down the line. The doctrine is down the line. The purpose of the church is down the line. Truth be told, I get up here. Hey, I might get up here like this morning, and I'll sing that song, What a Day It'll Be. Praise God. What a day it'll be. I can rejoice. I can shout. Why? Because there's a Jesus that's living inside of me that I know that there's coming a day, and I can respond to that song because I like the fact to know that it honors the Lord, and it's an old-time song. And it helps me and it stirs me up because it helps the purpose of me praising God. But the same way they turn around a while ago and say, when I think about the Lord. That's a whole different rhythm. It's a whole different style. It's a, but it's about the same Savior. I'm not trying to change the church, and I'm not knocking anybody. If y'all know anybody does this, we're not dropping lights in this place, and we're not going to be bringing smoke up here. If you see smoke, it might be some wind that comes out from up under tiny over there. Somebody say amen. And um, amen, but I, I'm glad you're here tonight. I love you, brother Tiny. <laughs> I feel the love. Amen. Me too. We're not changing all of that. But I tell you what matters is that we understand that God has put us here because he wants this community to be able to see a diverse group of people from different backgrounds, from different places. Hey, listen, a lot of us come from different churches, and the truth be told, some of our mindset comes from the churches or the pastors we set up under. Yeah. Our job is not to be like him. It's not to be like they. Our job is to be like Jesus. 
When he prayed, he didn't pray that they would see this church or that church. He said they prayed that they might see us. They might see unity in us the same way they see unity in God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Ghost. Jesus wasn't interested in us being like everybody else. Jesus was interested in us being like him and the God the Father and God the Holy Ghost. Can I get an amen right there? Let's go a little bit further. So I want to break this down if we could. What is unity? Turn over to Ephesians chapter number 4, if you will. What is unity? Let's read these verses just for a moment for the sake of time and dissect them. The Bible says, I therefore, a prisoner of the Lord, beseech you that ye walk worthy of the vocation wherewith ye are called, with all lowliness and meekness, and long, with long suffering, forbearing one another in love, endeavoring to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. There is one body, one spirit, even as ye are called in one, one hope of your calling, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, whom is above all and through all and in you all, but to every one of us is given grace according to the measure of the gift of Christ. I'm interested in verse number three where the Bible says keep the unity. What is unity? By definition, Unity is a oneness of purpose. It does not mean that we're all the same. That means that we are all unique going towards the same purpose. Can I get an amen right there? Unity is all of us being unique. It's being you, who you are, who God's called you to be, and who God has created you to be, but still with the same purpose. That is what unity is. Unity is something that is purpose-driven. It is not person-driven. We're not trying to be like somebody. We're not trying to be like a college. We're not trying to be like a Bible college. We're not trying to be like a church. We're not trying to be like a pastor. We're not trying to be like nobody's mom and daddy, their aunt and uncle, and whoever they like the most and listen to the most and read the most after. That's not who we're trying to be like. What we have is a purpose. Now let me say this, and it's probably going to lose you, but it'll be all right. You go back and study the scripture. We can talk about it later. It is very important that we understand our purpose, and this is why. Because it is proven in Genesis chapter number 3 when the Bible says that when God created, when he made mankind, that Eve was not created yet. She never came along until God had said that Adam needs to be a helpmeet. He needs a helpmeet. Why? Because he knows for God to be able to do what God needed to do in Adam, listen to me men, and for God to be able to use Adam the way he wanted to use Adam for the purpose that God had called Adam for and to fulfill and to complete that it was not God good for him to be alone. Therefore, God created a helpmeet because he knew for us to be complete and be a complete package to do a complete job for the purpose of the Lord Jesus Christ that we needed a wife. We needed to have a oneness within two people coming together as one. That's what the Bible teaches. Now, here's why that's important. Because in Genesis chapter number 3, the Bible says that he put him into the Garden of Eden. And he told him that you were to be there, that you were to be able to work the land, that you're to be able to till the land, that you're to do some things. He gave Adam job, purpose, and work long before Eve ever came along. He put him in the Garden of Eden because that was the presence of the Lord. He said, you want the presence of the Lord, I'm going to put you in the place of the presence of the Lord. But here's the key. For you to stay in the presence of the Lord, you got to keep fulfilling my purpose. And when you get outside of my purpose, you get outside of the place of the presence of the Lord. Can y'all at least give me an amen? Give me one on credit. Here's why that's so important. Because when you forget your purpose, that's when the devil gets in and he stirs things up. The devil came in, obviously came through with Eve. It wasn't Eve's fault. Why? Because she wasn't the man. The man ain't better. The man's responsible. That's what the Bible teaches. The Bible don't ever say that the man is better than the woman. The Bible don't ever say that he has more credit than the woman does. The Bible just teaches that man is responsible of the woman. So in her failure, he had to give an account to God because while she was sitting there in the presence of him, he could have stopped it. And the reason, listen, he didn't stop it is because he got outside of the place of his purpose. He forgot what he was there. He allowed the devil to come in. And then the devil caused a havoc and everything began to happen. Now, that's the same thing that the devil is doing to the church today in 2018 we have forgot our purpose we're so interested in ministries 
We're so interested in this for my children and this for my family. And I think all of that is fine and dandy, and I think it's needed. We're so interested in getting help and doing that. But let me say this. There's no greater help that you and I can ever have than to be able to sit in the center of the will of God and for God to be able to move in and to be able to stir our hearts when we've got a spirit of unity. You talk about getting healing. You talk about finding peace. You talk about having comfort in the midnight hour. It's when there's a presence here of the power of God, and God gets in. He'll stir your heart like a preacher can't stir it. He'll, he'll encourage you like a song can't encourage you. Why? Because the presence and the power of God can do what the church and nobody else can do. But we must have unity. We must know why we're here. We must know why we're here. And the Bible says that literally that they was to be able to have an endeavoring to keep the unity so they were to be able to be a purpose driven they were to know why they were here maybe I'll go a little step further if something was to happen to me you know what happens to the church it dies if the church is made up of me but if the church is made up of a godly purpose in the absence of a pastor or whoever else it may be the church still thrives and goes on why because you're not driven by a person you're driven by a purpose See, we've been preaching person. There's a lot of preachers that get up and make you feel guilty for the way you look, the way you act, the way you smell, the way you talk, the way you dress. And I, I'm not knocking none of that. I think it's needed. But let me just say this, honey. If the only reason why you change is because a preacher says something to you and that's it, then when you get mad at that preacher, you're going to quit doing what that preacher told you to do. What we got to do is preach Jesus. I said we got to preach Jesus. We gotta let people understand there's a relationship, and by that relationship, people will fall in love with the Lord. How do you know that, brother Jason? Because I fell in love with the Lord. And I, can I tell you something? He and I had nothing in common. He didn't like the music I like. Come on now, don't get quiet on me. He didn't like the friends I hang around with. He didn't like the places I went. He didn't like the things that I'd done. He didn't like the language that I probably used. He didn't like the thoughts that were in my head. But you know what? When I felt the love of God like I never felt the love of God, it had changed my life. And if we want to see people get saved, then what we got to do is we got to have a purpose to lift up Christ and allow God to be able to draw all men. And when they meet Jesus, God will change your life. You ever ask yourself, what happened to so-and-so? What happened to so-and-so? What happened to them? Why did they stop? What happened? I'll tell you what happened. The devil got in somewhere down the line. They allowed a situation to become to be a God. You say, no, they didn't. I say, yes, they did. Why? Because their situation dictated whether or not they was faithful to God in God's house more than the God was. Now, let me just say this before we all get quiet. We've all been there. Somebody say amen. We've all allowed a situation to hurt us. Can I get an amen right there? So don't get quiet on me, but here's why. When we forget our purpose, we forget why we come. So not only what is unity. Number two, how do we have unity? Notice what the Bible says. He says, endeavoring. Notice verse number three. Endeavoring to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. What do you mean that by that, Brother Jason? How do you have unity? I mean, what, what in the world do you do to come up with unity? Well, I want you to notice what the Scripture says. It does not say endeavoring to create unity. It does not. Do y'all see that? That word endeavoring, endeavoring means to be committed, to be, I, I talk about being diligent, working hard at it. For you and I to have unity, we don't just come up with this one, two, three program and everybody just jump on board and everything's fine. Listen to me. This ain't, this ain't deep stuff. This is shallow stuff. Endeavoring to what? To keep. Everybody say keep. See, if the Holy Ghost lives inside of you, and the Holy Ghost lives inside of me, and the Holy Ghost lives inside of everybody else, we ain't got to create unity, we got to keep unity. Why? Because there's unity between the Spirit within us. Are y'all with me now? The question is who we're yielding to. Are we yielding to self? Are we yielding to preference? Are we yielding to, to, hinder, uh, to, to heritage? Are we, are we yielding to, to what we want, what we like, what p- pleases people? Or are we yielding to the Spirit of God? Because when we, spirit, when we yield to the Spirit of God, there will be unity in the house of God. Now, I know this seems to be irrelevant to some people, and I don't know how many people like to learn the Word of God, but I, I love to learn the Word of God. And I say that because of this. A lot of us want to know, well, how can I make a difference at Haynes Baptist Church? I'll tell you what you can do. 
Just listen to the Spirit. Learn to keep your mouth shut when it says keep your mouth shut. Learn to smile when He tells you to smile. Worship Him when the Lord says to worship. Do whatever the Lord tells you to do. You do what the Spirit tells you. I'll do what the Spirit tells me. They'll do what the Spirit tells me. And we'll walk out here and say, praise God. There ain't a problem in the house of God. Everything's good. Amen. Unity. Why? Because we're keeping what the Spirit's already put inside of us. See, the Spirit has got unity within itself. And notice the word that says endeavoring. That means it's committed. In other words, you've got to work for it. <laughs> Y'all hear me? You've got to work for it. The devil is working overtime all the time. I mean, he don't ever take. I mean, I don't give the credit, give a credit, any devil any credit for whatever. I want to say this. He's a working devil, right? He's a working devil. He's a busy devil, right? He's a busy devil. But I'm talking about having you. Know, let me back up and pump for a minute because this ain't just relevant for the church. You got, if you got problems in your family, you got problems in your home, you got problems in your marriage, you got problems in your relationship, you got problems with your boyfriend and girlfriend or whatever you do, if your mom and dad let you date, there might be a problem because the spirit ain't connected on the inside. There might not be no unity. If we learn to quit doing what we've been taught, been raised to do all our life and start listening to Jesus, God might fix a whole lot more problems that we deal with. Amen. And I'll go a step further. If you ain't married and you dating, and they don't seem like y'all getting along, and you've been listening to the Holy Ghost, the Holy Ghost is probably trying to tell you, leave that jack leg alone. Amen. 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 <laughs> he said, there ain't no unity here. No, the Holy Ghost is telling you, pack your bags and get up out of that relationship. Everybody all right? Amen. We make it so complicated. We think, how can we have a place of peace? How can we have a place of peace? How can we have a place to be? You ever wonder, and, and I, please forgive me, but this is, well, I'm going to say it anyway. Some of you kids, I want you to hear me, because I need, I need to talk to y'all, because the parents will understand. <clears throat> Alcohol is forbidden in the Word of God. You kids believe that? Say amen. Amen. But let me tell you something about life. You boys listen to me. There's stories, and you've probably watched TV shows, that you could take alcoholics in a bar and you could watch them. And you know them turkeys will get down there and they'll fight and they'll sling snot. They'll bust beer by. They do crazy stuff. Y'all believe that, right? They do crazy stuff, all right? But do you believe that they'll get back up and if they can find a stool, they will stay there until the door closes and the 2 o'clock hour. You know why? Because sometimes an alcoholic understands their purpose to drink more than we do. Now let me say what I'm saying to you kids. Don't ever let the world understand their purpose greater than what we understand our purpose. God forbid that a worldly crowd can learn to get along because of an alcoholic bottle when we can make our mind up to get along all the time because of the Lord Jesus Christ. Did I make that good enough, parents? I make that good. Was that fair illustration? In other words, listen. If people can get happy over a ball team and a bottle and things that they do, don't you think that we ought to be able to get along and get happy over Jesus? In other words, let me, let me go a little deeper. So I was, I'm ashamed that God's people can't learn to get along any better than what they do when this world gets along better a lot, a lot of other times because of the purpose they got. Am I, am I making sense now? My, I'm not trying to educate our kids. I'm telling you, this world will leave you go. But here's what I'm trying to you got to make your mind up. What matters in the house of God is Jesus. It's Jesus. It's Jesus. And it amazes me how many people have been through so many things in this world, and they'll come in here, and somebody will step on their toes or say one thing, and they'll get upset and never come back to church, but they'll go right back out there and hang out with those same people that's hurt them all their life. You want to know why? They know their purpose out here. But we need to know our purpose in here. It's about the Lord Jesus Christ. And God forbid that anybody else get along better than what we do. But we have to make our mind up that we know what we're doing. We are keeping the spirit of unity. Now notice this. I need to hurry. He says endeavoring to keep the spirit. What that is, it's an atmosphere. Now, I want to say this. To be able to understand the spirit, you must be spiritual. Did you hear me? To be able to keep the spirit of unity, you must be spiritual. So if you've got bitterness, envy, problems, strife, it's hard for you to keep unity because you've got sin that's in your life. 
And if you're distracted by something in your life and you're not as spiritual as what you think you are, you might think that on the outside, but on the inside, see, God, the Bible says, looks on the heart of man. Man looks on the outward appearance. We must be clean on the inside and the outside so that we can think spiritually. Are you hearing me? I know I'm teaching tonight, but I'm just trying to teach it because we need to understand it. So when you come to this place, you have to see that we are to keep the spirit that is put within us. Now, I wrote this down. If you have conflict with you, don't be surprised that somebody else has conflicts with you too. If you sometimes get frustrated yourself, don't be surprised when somebody else gets frustrated with you. Now, that's plain and that's simple, I understand. But I, I, if you ca- listen, if you, get, if, you get, if you get mad at you, then what makes you think ain't nobody else going to get mad at you? I can't believe I did that. She can't believe you did that either. A spirit of unity allows you to see yourself. A spirit of unity looks more at me than it does everybody else. Why? Because I'm trying to get the Spirit of God to work inside of me. The Bible says be filled with the Spirit. Not filled with things, not filled with wine, not filled with alcohol. Why? Because it will dictate the way you act, the way you live, the way you speak, the way you think. But he said be filled with the Spirit so that we can have a spiritual Filled with the power of God, church. Number three, let's go forward. What are the hindrances of unity? Well, the Bible says it is a spirit. So what I mean by that is this. If you're not spiritual, you're not going to get it. Number two, a hindrance might be this. If the spirit ain't got the final say so, then you probably got more problems than you think you do. In other words, you must be yielded completely to the Holy Ghost to maintain a spirit of unity. Just because your friend agrees with you and you're out of the will of God does not make it okay that you're out of the will of God. The spirit must have the final say-so in your life. Another hindrance is we must always understand that when you're thinking on a matter, That if you're not yielded to the Spirit, it's going to be hard to maintain a spirit of unity. Here's why. Because if the Holy Ghost cannot control your mind. In other words, the point is this. Everything is led by the Spirit. And if you are not yielding to the Spirit, there's a whole lot of your life that's about to be messed up. And the greatest hindrance is that you try to deal with things by the way you feel and the way you think. And I got news. Listen. Ain't none of us going to get along if it ain't for Jesus. Huh? Caleb, if it weren't for Jesus, who wouldn't you like in this church? I'm just kidding. Don't answer that question. I'm just, I'm just kidding, y'all. I'm just kidding. Let's be honest. Tiny, there'd be a lot of people you probably wouldn't have got along with over, over time if it weren't for Jesus, is it? You wouldn't have tolerated it. Mm-hmm. See? At least he's honest. Let's, 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 let's see if you be honest. How many of you be honest say, if it weren't for the Lord in my life, there's been some people that's crossed my path I probably would have never got along with since I've been saved. Will you be honest? Raise your hand. <laughs> Raise two hands. Raise my foot, right? You know why we get along? Because of Jesus. You know why we ought to get along? Because of Jesus. You want, you want to know what ought to be our motivation? And as long as our motivation... We'll have unity. It's Jesus. People, people, people will feel Boston Red Sox, Fenway Park. And man, they'll be out there from all different walks of life. Truth be told, they've seen each other in the island. They might not like each other. But when they're there, they know why they're there. And they will get along. Some of them's good. Some of them's bad. Some of them's crazy. Some of them's stumbling. But they, don't, they know why they're there. Sometimes I feel like we forget why we are here. We forget why we are here. And let me just say this to you. Everybody that sings in the choir, everybody out there, they don't, they don't understand what you, go, what you go through and what you do. But if you remember why you are here and Jesus is your motivation, you'll never quit. And when you're sitting in a pew, listen, as long as Jesus is your motivation, you'll never quit. 
And when you're in a sound booth, if Jesus is your motivation, you'll never quit. If you're on the piano and Jesus is your motivation, you'll never quit. But the day you allow something else to be your motivation is the day that you will soon quit. Number four, what's produced by unity? What's produced by unity? That's what the Bible says, is spirit in the bond of peace. There's a peace that settles in, that is locked in when there's a spirit of unity, a peace like you've never experienced before. And I'll be honest, there's a lot that's in this life and a lot that's in this world that don't give me peace. But when I come to the house of God, I want to experience the peace of God. My life is crazy when it walks in. My world is turned upside down and sometimes there's even times that it seems like I am cluttered by events. But when I come to the house of God, I want a place of peace that I can come and I can relax and know that even though I'm not like everybody else, I will be loved because the Spirit of God lives in me like the Spirit of God lives in them. And even though I'm not perfect, they're going to know they ain't perfect too. I don't need, I don't need none of y'all to tell me I ain't perfect. Right? You don't need no, we know we ain't perfect, Right? I'm not talking about account. It's good to have accountability partners. But what I'm trying to say is what we got to do is we got to see us before we see anybody else. Let me say this to you. One thing that you're going to have to make sure is this. Is even though that there's a a peace that settles in, there's going to have to be a, a motivation. Let me share this before I go to my last point. A spirit of unity is only going to be there because you understand what it takes. And if you notice in verse number four, it starts off, there is one body, one spirit, even as you are called, in one hope of your calling. The way that you and I are going to maintain this is going to be simply by understanding that you and I are going to have to come to a place to where we constantly submit to one thing, and that is the oneness of God, Jesus, and the Holy Ghost. If you don't submit to the right thing, you're never going to last the way that we're supposed to last. If we submit to anything, we, listen, there's men that can come in here and can, and can raise $25,000, $30,000 like it ain't nothing. And man, you'll jump on his bandwagon and think he's the best thing since sliced bread. There's singers that can come in here, man, they know how to put on the show and they can do everything. You'll fall in love with their charisma, do everything. There's preachers that get in here and they preach a house down. There's people come in here, sit on the pews, and they can flown around and say whatever and have charisma. And, 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 the, and the truth be told, if you submit to those people, you'll fall because then people ain't going to last but when you submit to the oneness of God and you let the mind of God stay in you we'll always get along let me say this and be closed and I'll be done the Bible says in Romans 16 verse number 17 listen to this and I'll close now I beseech you brethren listen to this mark them which cause divisions Mark them which cause division and offenses contrary to the doctrine which ye have learned and avoid them. Now I want to tell you this. And I've dealt with this a whole lot over the past couple years in this church. Not from y'all, I'm just saying. We've seen people come and go. I want you just to hear me. My prayer sometimes as a pastor is that our church has enough discernment to mark people that are not here for the right reasons and they have selfish intentions. And I will always support and I will look over this congregation to the best of my ability to mark those that cause division in this body. There's times and even recently I have went to certain people and I said, listen, No longer do you meet with this person, and here's why. It's at a church level. And that's where, and this is for some of you that are always trying to help people. Y'all know what I'm talking about? We always see the best in somebody. I'm that way. Man, I'll go to the very end of the world for some people. But there comes a time where you got to let go because you realize they're causing more division than they are unity in the house of God. Are you hearing me? And I want you to know it's okay to teach these children, these boys on the back and these girls and these kids over here. It's okay to teach them. I didn't say alienate people. I didn't say that. But it's okay to mark those that cause division. Why? Because our purpose is to maintain a place of a spirit of unity. 
The last thing I want somebody to do is come in here and stir up what God's already tried to put together. Amen? Amen. Miss Deborah, you come. I'll give you my last point. Why must we be, or my, my, why must we have a spirit of unity? I want to read what the Bible says in Psalms 133. Listen to this. Behold, how good and how pleasant is it for the brethren to dwell together in unity? It is like the precious ointment upon the head that ran down upon the beard, even Aaron's beard, that went down to the skirts of his garments. And the dew of Hermon, as the dew descended upon the mountains of Zion, listen, for there the Lord commanded the blessing, even life forevermore. The Bible says that the Lord commanded a blessing because there was unity. Do you know why we keep unity in the house of God? Because God promises he'll bless us. And if we want the blessing of God, then we're going to have to keep unity in God's house. Now, I want to say this to you. That's, this ain't a hallelujah, popular, shucking corn, preach a sheetrock off the wall kind of message. And I understand that. But I'll tell you why. Because unity reflects us. And it's hard sometimes to realize that the very problem that we might have might not be everybody else. Sometimes it's us. We could be the problem of unity. And I challenge every member, visitor, person that comes, the hangs back. I don't, I don't care who you are. If you're here tonight and you're a child of God, I want you to think about how much effort you give to yield to the Spirit, to allow a spirit of, of unity to exist. Does people have liberty to be able to come to you? Can they, can they talk to you? Can they, can they have fellowship with you? Can they... Can they speak to you in the way where it seems like everything's all, or, or are there people that you deliberately pass by to avoid? Are there people that you intentionally go around because you know things just ain't what they need to be? I've always, I've always said this and it's backfired a thousand times on me, I know. I've always said people in leadership need to always get along. I've always said that. And I believe it. How can we expect the church to get along if leadership don't get along? Right? Huh? How, how can the world get along if they don't see the church get along? Why would people want to come to church everybody in here fighting all the time? Huh? And some of y'all, y'all know what I'm talking about. And you look at some people and think, how in the world could they act like that? I'll tell you why. Because they don't, they don't yield to the Spirit of God. And if we want liberty in this place, and we want unity in this place, then we're going to have to allow the, the Holy Ghost to dictate everything that we do. And I promise you, the people walk in those doors, when they walk in this place, they might, not, they might not look like you. They might not look like me. But they'll feel welcome. They might be a sinner. But I think they ought to feel welcome. Everybody said, bless God, a sinner ought not to feel welcome in the house of God. I'm not knocking men who say that. Don't be mad at me. But I would say this. I do want them to feel welcome in the house of God. I do. I don't want them to be okay with their sin. I'm not going to tiptoe around nobody's sin and act like it's all right. But, you know, listen, when I go to the hospital, I don't, I don't want to walk in the hospital and I don't want them to act like they're trying to kick me out the same day. I mean, if I want some help, I need to know somebody cares enough to help me. So people walk in this door, we're going to have the spirit of you. We need to know, hey, these people need some help. And you might not think we need to help them. And you might not think we need to help them. But they might think we need to help them. But as long as we yield to the spirit, we got one purpose. It don't matter what we think. What matters is what God wants. I believe God to do something in our church if we allow Let's pray. As a pastor, I want to thank you for viewing our video today. However, if God's dealt with your heart, we do not want to end this video without giving you a chance to be able to accept Jesus Christ as a personal Savior. If you're there today and God's actually dealing with your heart, I want to remind you what the Bible says, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. That means every single one of us has had problems, issues, sin, failures, faults in our past. 
The great thing is this, is that Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man coming through the Father but by me. There is a way to be able to have hope, to have eternal security within the Lord Jesus Christ, to be able to know that you're saved by the grace of God. Now the great thing about the Bible is it tells us about the love of God. He says, For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth Him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. And that's amazing to a lot of people, and they can quote it. But the beauty of it is this, is the very next verse tells us the purpose of Christ. Because the Bible says, For God sent not a Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through Him might be saved. That means that God sent His Son to die for those of us who are sinners, so that we can have fellowship with God Himself. Now, if you're there today and God's really been dealing with your heart, I want to ask you this question. Do you really believe that God's been dealing with you about salvation? If that's the case today, then I want to tell you what you need to do is repent of your sins. You need to die to yourself. Admit that you're lost and you're on your way to hell. And then look at what the Bible tells us, that He tells us that we can be saved through Christ. Who do you call on? There's only one. Because the Bible says, Neither is there salvation in any other, for there's none other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. It's only through Christ and Christ alone. So I tell you today, would you trust in Christ? I want to ask you would, you, would you trust in Him as a personal Savior? You say, Brother Jason, I don't really know if I can do that. Well, let me tell you, the Bible also tells us that whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. It don't matter who you are, where you come from, God sent His Son to die for everyone. If you've made this decision today to be able to trust in Christ, to be able to die to yourself, to, to be able to start living for Christ and accept Him as a personal Savior after repenting, would you do us a favor and be able to contact us at 336-788-0551 and let us know about this decision that you made so we can start praying for you. Thank you so much.